Now we're going to talk about a slightly different approach or model, if you will, public-private partnerships to accelerate discoveries. You know, at 18% of GDP, the U.S. healthcare system is really unsustainable in its, in its current form. Collectively, we must find better, cheaper, faster ways to deliver care that focus on cures and health instead of simply treating symptoms. Unconventional alliances between academia, industry, and companies can expedite revolutionary technologies and advance therapeutic development. Mr. David Mazzo, Dr. Maria Milan, and Dr. David Pierce are here to talk about one example of a public-private partnership. Working together, they've worked to stop the destruction of insulin-producing cells in children with new-onset diabetes so they can avoid a lifetime of needles and medication. So welcome, ladies, ladies and you. gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I've asked each of them to give us just a little thumbnail sketch kind of of what, who they are, where they're coming from, so that we know what the, what the context is. And then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the details of how this partnership is working. David? Well, thank you, Max. So I represent the public aspect of the public-private discussion here today, and I'm the president and CEO of a company called Caladrius Biosciences, which is a biopharmaceutical company developing cellular therapies in autoimmunity and an ischemic repair disease. But in the context of our conversations today, we'll be talking about our T-regulatory cell program which uses autologous, ex vivo expanded and activated polyclonal T regulatory cells to help counteract the uh, attack of the immune system in type 1 diabetes. Thank you. Oh, that was brief. Good. <laughs> <laughs> That's the briefest I've heard anybody all, all week. <laughs> When told to be Maria, brief, I usually yeah. take, <laughs> take oh, it to I'm, heart. I'm, I'm, I'm We're here to accelerate. To yes. Maria. <laughs> so I'm, I'm Maria Milan, and I'm, I was trained as, actually as a transplant surgeon. So I started my career as a director of uh, pediatric organ transplantation at Stanford, where I also ran a basic science lab. And um, in 2005, 2006, started to become uh, really interested in the promise of cell therapy as I transplanted little babies, um, age of six months, less than five kilos, for different um, disorders, including metabolic disorders, where they're just missing one enzyme, yet they're subjected to pretty um, major surgery. Um, and their moms are often the donors, just six months out from having given birth. Um, I knew that with the science uh, where it was, I needed to be part of that. So I went out into biotech um, to pursue this um, area and then joined CIRM a little bit over uh, five years ago. So um, CIRM was formed in 2004 by patients and patient advocates um, directly on the heels of all the discoveries from the Human Genome Project and the concurrent discoveries in stem cell biology. And the patients with philanthropic support, um, put a measure on the ballot uh, for California to fund stem cell research um, with a protected $3.5 billion. I mean, 3.5, no, just $3 billion. <laughs> $3 billion. And so we are um, happy to um, share where we are today in a little bit. Thank you. Terrific. David, we've seen you before a couple of times up here. Indeed. Um, I'm uh, yes. So, so uh, in the context of your question, uh, Max, so as the executive vice president of uh, Sanford Health, uh, we're the largest uh, rural healthcare, non for profit healthcare organization in, in the United States. Uh, so, my role working with uh, partners, and you're going to hear a little bit more for, with respect to our partnership with Caladrius, is this. Obviously, we want to introduce treatments and cures for our patients. We have a very robust basic and translational research program. And we have a number of our own physician-initiated clinical trials uh, that we develop from our own intellectual uh, aspects. So when we're approached by you know, outside partners, then really it's a question of, will this be an impact for our patients? Do we have a large patient base that will benefit from this? And I like to think of this as an inverted pyramid in terms of the number of contacts that I get each week and how it decreases down to the point where, obviously, first of all, you know, many of them will be come back when you have an IND. Uh, because we can't really partner on, a, on an activation of a clinical trial if, if it's not approved at that period of time. Uh, then going down to the fact that obviously you, you've heard a little bit from Kelby, our CEO, this morning about how we're an integrated health system. We have a health plan, we have healthcare delivery, and research is also integrated. 
my clinical research team is embedded within the, the hospital and clinic systems. So in many respects, we can function as a CRO, and we're much cheaper than a CRO um, in terms of doing, performing that clinical trial because it means something to our patients. It means something to our organization. Right down to the point of the pyramid where if we really believe in the technology and the clinical trial that we're performing, much like we do with the T-Rex trial that uh, David is talking about, is we may invest in that company. Much like the fact that we're the, the only healthcare organization that has completed an adipose-derived stem cell clinical trial in an orthopedic setting, and that was in partnership with Dr. Eckhard Alt's company in Genron that you heard about two days ago. So uh, we're a non-for-profit. We'll work with anybody if we think it's going to really benefit uh, our patients. Terrific. So before we get into the, the, the real sort of nitty-gritty of the T-Rex trial and, and diabetes here, David, we traditionally there's been a firewall between industry, government, academia, uh, you know, the separation of church and state mm -hmm. here, uh, and to coin a phrase, um, and things that kind of cross those boundaries were always sort of suspect. Yeah, and I think that the that what has changed over the last perhaps decade is the fact that. Uh, it, it goes to some of the conversations we've heard earlier this afternoon about a team approach to solving problems. We've, we've learned over time that, you know, my background is you know, 25 years in big pharma. And when I came up through big pharma, everything that ultimately led to a drug started and ended in big pharma. All the discovery work, all the pharmacology work, all the clinical work, all the commercial work all happened. That's very different from the way the model is today. Uh, most of the discovery work is done in academic institutions, and uh, the only way to access that is to find a way to partner with academic institutions. And some of the boundaries in the past had to do with simple lack of mechanism for protecting intellectual property or worrying about long-term ownership of information. Once those things were sorted out, it became much easier to collaborate, and, and in today's world, it's, a, it's actually a necessity. So Maria has the breaking down of those boundaries or, or silos, if you will, helped? Are we actually accelerating Absolutely. research, discovery, innovation? Absolutely. If there are walls, they're porous walls, and they're selectively <laughs> porous walls. Because um, as, as David had, had stated, most of the, even the um, recently approved, first, first um, approved um, CAR-T therapies, mm -hmm. as well as the SPARC therapeutics trial for blinding eye disease, um, they, were both, they were all developed in academia, and there may have been some external funding, but primarily, um, even for Spark, the PI actually went with the company, because the type of, these types of products just require such um, specialized um, knowledge of the biology. They're living, mm -hmm. they're living medicines. Mm -hmm. They're not synthetic, and they're not even <laughs> antibodies that you get, you know, even though antibody um, production is complex think about how complex that was, this is so much more complex than that. So there is a, that partnership and that kind of the handoff requires a lot of hand-holding for a period of time. And so, uh, you know, some prime examples of that, we have, um, you know, recent examples are that CIRM, through a very um, rapid and efficient funding process, thanks to an overhaul that we had um, gone through three years ago um, um, when Randy was, was there, um, we were able to get money out to the... Um, to, the, to our grantees within a, in less than 150 days. That's, that's quick by any wow. standard. So if we can't accelerate, we're not going to be able to, to accelerate others. So we get the money out. We de-risk the program um, so that the investigators can actually do the work so that traditional investors could come in. So we so-called de-risk until there's clinical data, there's proof of concept that there's actually a potential product here. And, of course, it's under regulatory, um, you know, um, allowances. And um, at that point, so one of our programs is uh, called, um, is a product for ADA skid, which is one of the first indications for bone marrow transplantation. But in many cases, patients don't have a match. Randy mentioned that in his presentation. Mm -hmm. And also there are some um, complications still with graft versus host. So, there are, so our investigators are developing an autologous, um, meaning from the same patient, product um, where the hematopoietic stem cell is then um, modified to fix that enzyme and given back. So that type of thing, you can't just throw that over the wall. So that PI 
We funded the PI to conduct the pivotal study, and Orchard Therapeutics was formed to license in the study, and so has subsequently received over 100 million in financing after some initial data was coming out. Um, and we, we funded the tech transfer from the investigator to the industry. So there can't be, there can't be secrets. In fact, we held um, joint meetings together with our clinical advisory panels. Um, as the funders, it's milestone-based, so it's in our best interest. We bet on them. We want them to succeed. We're all there together with the industry partner, the investigator, academic investigator, and us to make sure this moves forward. So, David, the other David over there on the far end, uh, tell me how these kinds of partnerships have worked in T-Rex, and, and where are we with T-Rex? Yeah, so, I mean, it, it's been a, a really productive partnership. Uh, you know, I think uh, hopefully David and I are going to have a little bit of a love fest here mm -hmm. in talking about how this has worked. I mean, uh, once we first uh, were exposed to Caladrius and uh, the T-Rex uh, technology in terms of the expansion of these T-regs. One of the things we're very interested in at Sanford is really, you know, bringing a cure to type 1 diabetes. Um, so the journey has been this, is, is that the clinical trial was brought to us um, and uh, we've sort of functioned partly as that CRO and partly as the investor uh, to get this particular trial done. Um, it has never been, no cellular therapy has been admitted for two patients with type 1 diabetes before. So we did the first 18 patients just at Sanford, and the FDA really wanted to take a little, you know, look at the safety and tolerance of this particular therapeutic there, uh, which was good because we could keep it in-house, and we really got to understand how to actually roll out a very, very complicated clinical trial just within our own health system. Uh, following that, uh, the FDA gave the green light and, and gave Collagius fast track status, which has never been granted for any type 1 diabetes clinical trial before. And then we just rolled on to the other clinical sites and, and, and really, you know, we could take our team and, and really help out how to roll that clinical trial out. Uh, and then I'll let David just talk about how quickly um, the next phase of the clinical trial actually went. Is that something that could have been done without this kind of cooperation? Uh, certainly not in that speed, right? Oh, not at that speed. Could have been, certainly could have been done and ultimately would have been done, but probably would have cost a lot more time and certainly more money. So there were a lot of benefits to, to, the, to the association. And one of the things that, you know, really uh, initially because of the construct of the T-Rex trial, which was, as David said, the first time we've used autologous cells in pediatric diabetics uh, in the United States, there was you know, a, a safety concern, as, as there should have been from FDA, and this requirement for an, a cohort of 18 patients to be treated first and then a pause for their evaluation. You know, typically, starting up sites in a clinical trial, for those of you who aren't familiar, is really one of the most time-consuming aspects in addition to all the approvals you need to get from the various institutional IRBs and, and then the training that takes place. It's then recruitment of patients and bringing them into the system. The fact that we had a healthcare system, not just a, a hospital, but a system as our, uh, our partner, really allowed for the enrollment of those 18 patients in a very rapid way. And, you know, and maybe I'll show a, a, a prejudice that may be common to a lot of Americans who you know, come from one or the two coasts. But I really didn't expect that uh, facilities in North and South Dakota, which are not really the population centers of the United States, would be able to enroll patients, specialized patients, in such a rapid fashion. And I think it was the fact that they have this system in place that really made it something uh, extraordinarily fast. Interesting. So, Maria, is the, are you, ju not to say just, but <laughs> primarily a funder of these, or do you also play a role in expediting, putting partners together? Are you a matchmaker, and, and do you also figure out how to, how to make these things work a little more smoothly? So absolutely, we do it all. So we're a funder and we're a partner. And when we say partner, we actually partner up with these programs even before they apply for, to us. Because we have a, a peer review process that's independent of us. We know what it would take to get there, first of all, to be even eligible to come in and these programs need to be ready. So to come in for a clinical trial, they have to have an active IND, that's a permission from the FDA to, to do the trial. 
Um, so our science officers actually work with these programs to really say, what is your technology really? Are you highlighting um, why this is something that CIRM should fund for an unmet medical need? Is it feasible? Is it a strong? Is it the is it the strongest possible um, proposal? Uh, do you have the data to support this? And through that process, we we again insert an efficiency because we don't want grants to keep coming back for resubmission. That's not accelerating. That's decelerating. If they are worth funding, and it would be a shame for that to happen just because people didn't put the right things down and didn't really highlight the, the key uh, things that our reviewers would be really interested in. So that's one thing. And then once they're funded, um, we partner with them to contract that as quickly as possible. So within 150 days, they get their money. During that time, we form a clinical advisory panel for them. We bring in uh, key experts um, in, in various aspects of what may be important for that project. And we have patient representatives. And just by the way, patient representation is on at every single part of our process. They're on our grants working group, they're on our board, and they're on these clinical advisory panels. That's also accelerating because when the patient tells you, uh uh, I don't think that we would, as a family, would be able to do that for that protocol. You say, why? What, what can we deploy to make that happen, et cetera? You, if you had that off at the pass, you do, you know, enrollment, as David said, is a key bottleneck and gating item for clinical trials. Um, and then we partner with them in regulatory, so when they get, start to get some clinical data, we can help t them take advantage and engage in the new accelerating um, regulatory paradigm, 21st Century Cures Act um, created a um, pathway within the FDA called the RMET, the uh, Regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapies designation, which is a combination of a breakthrough um, designation with frequent um, interactions with the FDA and potential for accelerated approval. And that pathway is an incredible way that the FDA and the sponsors can have conversations, learn about products, learn about the right things to look at. And of the 15 RMATs that have been um, awarded by the FDA so to date, and that, that's only been in place for a little bit over a year, of the 15, four of them are CIRM programs. Hmm. And we have many more lined up. And so that, the, the days of phase one, phase two, phase three, large trials, for these type of therapies is, is in the past. Because for, for one thing, many of our programs are targeting rare diseases, mm -hmm. so you're not going to have lunch trials. Secondly, because of the mechanism of action, a type of product one has, um, the types of readouts, the type of things you look for are different. So that, so there are ways that um, the FDA is working, our wor is working with our um, programs to fast track even the trials in a, some, sometimes just a continuous development where you don't have to do a phase one stop, do a phase two stop. You could just uh, mm -hmm. take a look along the way as a clinical trial comes in. So, cool. So, so David, it strikes me then that what Maria was just describing is, in other words, you don't have to reinvent the wheel each time that that you move into a trial or try to bring something to market or, or, or as I said, or, or do a trial. Um, she's helping facilitate that, grease the wheels, if you will, so that, because that's a lot of wasted time that the patients don't want to know about and can't really afford for the most part. So is that kind of what, what, what you're getting out of, uh, out of this partnership? I would say yes. I would, in fact, I would say we've completed those phases. Uh, we've actually done that. You know, if you're going to communicate a clinical trial to a patient, you better be sure it's going to be ready very soon. Uh, and that's one of the miscommunications that I think that uh, in science, you know, there's a lot of miscommunications all the time in terms of where we are at. And then we had a great discussion yesterday with a small group on CRISPR in terms of the expectations of CRISPR. And of course, it's not quite ready for prime time just yet. So I think it's, it's really very important. And in the context of, say, the stem cell clinical trial that we've done and completed with Rotator Cuff right now, the FDA, I mean, with the Faster Cures Act, wonderful invention. They're still feeling things out themselves because they're not quite sure how to handle the next steps. We have safety and efficacy data for a, an orthopedic clinical trial in one joint using autologous fat-derived stem cells. What if we want to put it in another joint? 
So that's what we're doing. We've already, we're launching uh, a wrist, a back, and a knee trial because hopefully we will be able to get what you call a master file together for that one therapeutic that can be delivered across the whole of the uh, body for these orthopedic situations. So I think we just have to be very careful how we proceed because some, well, with all of these new therapies, we're making up the rules as we go along. And the FDA, wonderful as they are, they've got, they're struggling to keep up. Not many orthopedic surgeons work for the FDA to review our protocols. And that's exactly where I was going to go with you, is that what's the role of, of government here? Have they been cooperative and helpful? Because this, is, this really is a brand new area in many ways. It's, an, it's, a, it's a truly a new area. And I think that you know, it, 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 it'll be perhaps unusual for the CEO of a biopharmaceutical company to actually pay a compliment to the FDA, because normally we, we consider them sort of adversarial. But in fact, you know, in the last two years or so, the FDA has seen a real change in attitude as it relates specifically to regenerative medicine, cellular therapies, gene therapies, because there's been a, a realization that's been reduced to practice that the traditional paradigm of drug development, you know, preclinical animal models, pharmacology, toxicology, then phase one in humans, healthy adults, and so on and so forth, just doesn't apply to cellular therapies. You know, you, you just think of it when you start with an autologous cell therapy, as Marie explained, you know, a cell therapy that comes from a patient going back to that same patient. So you're your own manufacturer of your own therapy. How do you test that in an animal model? You know, mm -hmm. you know, you're the animal, you're, right. you're the model. So everything has to change. And it's taken a while for the government to get their head around that because, and here's where the compliment comes in, ultimately they take their mandate of protecting public health very seriously. And it could be quite dangerous for people to be using the equivalent of cell therapy snake oil, mm -hmm. which was basically why the Food and Drug Act was formed back in the 1930s because people were using synthetic things and just you know, giving them to people and people were getting hurt. So I think that the government has come around. There's still a lot to be done. The 21st Century Cures Act is a step in the right direction, but it's generally, it, uh, maybe not even a road map yet. It's sort of you know, a topographical map. We have to see where the roads go. They have to be painted on it yet, but we're getting there. Maria, has the government gotten better at all of this? We've had many um, joint, Francis Collins was here um, past two days, many joint meetings with the NIH and the FDA in the same room. Now the next step is to get CMS in with us. And I think this common theme of collaboration and communication and alignment is something that is, it's really just wonderful to start seeing that um, in practice. Um, so the FDA, um, with the with the Cures Act, really meant it when they 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 put the, they have this RMAT designation and they could have had it and not um, not done anything with it, but instead they they actually set a goal of one arm at a month, one mm. arm at a month, because wow. they know that's out there because they recognized that by their traditional expedited pathways, less than 15% of cell therapies ever got an expedited pathway because they were just not the proper criteria. And so with this new pathway, they have really challenged themselves to have a look, and it's not just take anything in. They are still extremely selective, but it provides a platform for discussion um, and, and, and exchange of information and learning. Um, so in that way, they've been very, very helpful. There's still more to do. I think that um, at, in California, there's been a shift in terms of recognizing where the money's gone, and I think it's starting to go into the positive now that we have 48 clinical trials, now that we're starting to see patients who are five years out from previous trials who are cured of their um, ailments, such as um, immune deficiency, and they're starting to see that industry is, uh, uh, is starting to invest in the field, so that's validating. Mm -hmm. Um, almost 500 million in disclosed investments into our programs last year alone, and and um, the initial investment, you know, we deployed about 2.5 billion dollars to fund infrastructure education, basic science, 900 million to basic science. Um, another, an additional 1.9 billion dollars has come in mm. from from other stakeholders. David, final word. Tell me uh, quickly. Can you summarize? How's the T-Rex trial going? Mm -hmm. What's happening? 
So we have disclose any data that you know. So, so we have finished recruitment or in partnership with Collagius recruitment has been completed uh, and an interim analysis was done because uh, 56 so half of the patients are one year through um, and we're not allowed to, to disclose any results. Um, but David and I just met uh, recently and had a very spirited discussion on what our next steps are going to be. We believe that this is going to have a, a major impact for type 1 diabetes. And, that's great. And perhaps that's the key point. You know, this is a phase two trial and it's designed to define the next steps. And so that's really also something that's a bit unusual uh, for these types of partnerships in the sense that when you aren't bound by the typical paradigm of sort of big pharma sequential development, before the results of phase two are actually known, we can be talking about plans and implementing plans. And so that's another way that you accelerate development. Terrific. We're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank our, our panel. It's thank actually, you. I think, encouraging that, that uh, things are moving along in a way that can actually accelerate discovery. Yes? Yes, Good. absolutely. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you.